Hans, you posted a video about all the pushback that you've gotten about network audio and especially that you've gotten pushback from people that are in the network field. Um, I'm both a network engineer and a hobbyist uh, speaker builder and sometimes designer. And this is just going to be a response video. And the problem is, is you don't know what you don't know. And we're going to go through this and we're going to go ahead and expose some of the, um, the logical um, issues with your argument and where the holes are. I've had a number of reactions again on the review of the fantastic Uptone Audio Ether Regen Audio File Ethernet Switch, especially from people with knowledge of computer networks. They state, simply put, that if the sound differs, the switch must have altered the data. I agree, but in what way? So let's get past this first logical fallacy. Switches do not alter data. Switches pass on frames that are regenerated every time that they hit another outbound or inbound switch port. Now we're not even talking about routing at this point. We're just talking about switching. We're talking about layer two. We're talking about frames. So we're going to go move on to the first piece that we need to poke a hole in and that's actually going to be uh, very much quite simple. We're going to have a couple things that we can show. One is we can show that using MD5 checksum outside of doing some sort of force collision domain, which is possible with MD5. It takes very contrived circumstances to do that and it's not an issue for our day to day. We're going to go ahead and speak to this next part in your video. Can a switch have so much influence on the sound quality? In the end, the only way to establish this is to listen. Trained listeners certainly don't need double blind tests if the stereo setup used has sufficient audiophile qualities. See my view on double blind tests in a separate video. All right, let's take this first problem and, and pick it apart. Um, one is switches don't affect your audio output. Uh, there is one case where if your layer one cabling is shielded and you have shield tied to ground between the two pieces, you can create ground loop and introduce that. But that's not a switch problem. That is a cabling layer one problem. It could even be a power supply problem. It's not a data problem and it's not a transfer or transmittal of data problem. The second problem that we get into is what is a trained listener? And two, how do we establish the bona fides of a trained listener? Well, we do it through double blind testing. We have a trained listener sit down, maybe we take a 192 um, bit MP3 versus full red book resolution and have them sit down and validate their hearing that way. It's got to be done blind. Um, issues like the McGurk effect uh, prove that um, we definitely can be fooled in our senses of hearing. So that's out the window. You have to do this blind. You cannot do this sighted. Um, there's just there's too much literature working against you on this fact. Now in this next part you bring up PoE. I'm not sure why you're bringing up PoE since PoE isn't needed for these applications. Uh, PoE is used for applications where we have security cameras. We have wireless access points. Um, there are even some instances where we can drive uh, well, obviously phones with it, but also um, some displays, some displays with the HD 10 base T standard, which is uh, uh, another standard that does use PoE can actually drive signage displays. Did not use magnetic modules and you might wonder why. But the Ether region does use them. Perhaps here again quality of the components play a role. The magnetic modules I found use center tap transformers for use with power over Ethernet, abbreviated to PoE. Only a slight mismatch between two halves of the transformer windings might already cause a DC offset. That offset might even be within ITRIP. All right, so here's the next issue that you've gotten into. Um, this is another logical fallacy. First off, the only thing that Ethernet requires is this stuff to be in spec. 
and it's not even going to be the port that's going to be the problem it's going to be the interconnect is going to be the cable that you use that's actually where your biggest near end crosstalk where your largest problems with um, interpair skew and cable imbalances happen is actually in the cable itself and it's actually in the termination where you punch down at those are where your real problems are going to exist it's actually not going to be on the pcb it's not going to be on the magnetics package that is uh, surface soldered on so again another logical fallacy and we got ways around this one we've got wireless if you're really concerned two we've got fiber optics if you're really concerned but when it really comes down to it just buy a trip light a pandua even uh blue jeans they all make cable that is going to certify out and you know they'll they do the stuff on you know a 12 to eighteen thousand dollar fluke analyzer um so when the cables hit that type of equipment and it's certified out, it usually certifies way up beyond the specifications. So again, another non-issue. Um, you just want to keep throwing red herrings out, and it's because you, I just don't believe that you actually have anything real to say about this. All right, your phase noise argument is really where we're indicative of how much you don't know. Um, I'm tempted to just let this play this back in full. It's only a minute or two, and then we'll go and let it play, and then I will comment. And you might wonder why. But the Ether region does use them. Perhaps here again quality of the components play a role. The magnetics modules I've found use center tap transformers for use with power over Ethernet, abbreviated to PoE. Only a slight mismatch between two halves of the transformer windings might already cause a DC offset. That offset might even be within IEEE specifications for it won't disturb normal network use. I'll come back to this offset later on. All digital techniques work with stepped processes, like a mechanical clock that steps through a minute in 120 half second movements of the escapement. Digital techniques have a crystal oscillator as escapement, which makes sure that going through the steps happens at a regular interval. In this graph those intervals are drawn by vertical dotted lines and a digital signal then looks like this. At least in theory, in practice those intervals are not really as constant as we would like. That becomes visible when on an oscilloscope the traces are superimposed. This animation shows what happens. We see the vertical lines get wider since they vary in timing. Sometimes the vertical movement both up and down are earlier or later. This phenomenon is known as jitter. Within limits this is no problem for data transport. Even if it goes wrong and a bit is missed the error correction is able to repair that bit or even more than one bit. And when the error correction is confronted with too many faults to repair, the receiving site simply asks the sender to resend the package. Alright, well let's back that up just a bit and let's discuss this. Alright, so we aren't concerned with the leading or trailing edge of this. What we're considered um, and concerned with is the eye. As long as the eye meets spec, we don't care about these edges. These edges mean nothing. It's basically the high, low, or the on off value that our particular encoding mechanism is concerned with. And as long as the eye is clean and readable, we have successful transfer. And you are right on this the jitter does not matter. And it doesn't matter, and it doesn't matter for a reason that I don't know, either you don't know or you are being um, obtuse in your presentation and not being forthcoming about it. And let's go ahead and line that out. So I'm going to go to my music folder on my file server. I'm going to go to Rachmaninoff here. And I have taken his Symphony Number no. 2 and I've concatenated all the tracks into a single file here. We're going we're gonna to do a copy of this and we're going to do a paste. Now remember, we're going to also go down 
we're going to task manager and we're going to go to performance and we're going to look at our ethernet performance all right so our throughput right now is nominal we're actually not doing anything on the wire so in your video you're talking about this interval where we're transferring data so here's what happens when I copy go back here and we see our copy operation there it did blip the network and we're going to paste we spent literally just a couple of seconds on the wire and you can see that we went as much as this can full wire rate and then we're back down to zero so if anything was happening on this this is where it would have happened now it's not a concern that we're copied over and we're going to go into J River so I'm going to pause the video and bring J River up so J River is brought up and we have some nominal probably maintenance traffic going across the connection and that's probably because J River is open and it's talking to the file server and obviously we have this going on and no music's playing and then I'm gonna go ahead and go back to music I'll go back to Rachmaninoff and we're gonna go here and we're gonna start our playback I have J River set up to cache the entire track, which is about 540 megs, if I don't recall. And now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn off our network adapter. I'm going to pause this for a second and we see that we can't access our file server any longer but what I can do is I can go to any point in this track now and continue playback. I'll turn that down a little bit. So the point being is, is we've cast the entire track. Let me go ahead and enable this again. go and we can go back here and reestablish our connection there there we have it so what I've shown is by caching this entire track and we did it literally in seconds let me go back to our Ethernet there we go so what's happened with this piece right here what's even happened with Let me see where else we've got. Yeah, other artifacts. All this happened within the first two to three seconds that I started playing this track and J River cast the entire thing up. And the same thing is going on with modern streamers that have, you know, a couple minutes worth of uh, buffer on them for Redbook Audio. This stuff is transferred at full wire rate as fast as it can get it to local storage and played out so the next question we got to come up with is um, what's the difference between playing it out of cache RAM and playing it off hard drive and again I'm gonna suggest that the answer is nothing uh, these uh, ultra expensive SATA cables are not gonna make a difference um, you know you might as well start talking about you know sending your motherboard off so they can replace all the copper traces with some sort of cryogenically treated copper you know uh, obviously nobody can but you know that's okay but it just does get the point across that this again is a red herring um, you either know better or you're ignorant of it and um, uh, you know neither is a good option nor a good look for you all right and the last balloon to pop is you bringing up this cord DAC that has its own internal cache that can play for three seconds on average um, one is is this doesn't even have 
its own Ethernet input. It is, um, I looked it up, it's um, Toslink. I think it has AES and it obviously has USB. And this isn't being fed direct by a network cable, so I'm not sure why you brought this up as a red herring. Because the, the common piece on it having its own cache is that all the connections to it don't feature a downstream switch which you're reviewing. So this is another red herring. What you should be reviewing at the very least or bringing in as an example is a network audio streaming player like Carry, Name, Lumen, um, or even something like the box I've built for hosting with J River Media Center. So um, I do want to simply state that I think a computer with a well-built DAC will sound just as every bit as resolving as high fidelity as any purpose-built um, DAC out there. As an example, I'm a former carry uh, carry owner of a $4,000 piece of carry. So um, I'm much happier with the flexibility I'm given with a computer and J River. And J River is not the only audio player that can, um, you know, cache entire tracks. Uh, and J River does it up to a gig, but it's just my preference um, and that's it so that's all I have to say these are just some of the holes that I wanted to poke in the logic that you presented and you did suggest at the beginning of your video that other people that disagree with you get their own YouTube channel and it, it's not a problem and uh, we can hit this ball back and forth across the net as long as you want but Hans you're incorrect and you simply are not gonna win with your uh, current base of knowledge it's just you're too limited by it and um, again it's it's what you don't know that's going to get you and obviously it's gotten the best of you here